the Tim Davis Podcast. Something was pressed upon me this week about the connection between courage and mercy. That's something we don't generally connect, isn't it? You think of someone that's courageous, you almost think of them as as non-merciful sometimes. If you have your uh, devotional handy, open them up, please, and look at the quotes. Notice I called it a devotional. What's William Butler Yeats saying? We should honor those who die on the field of battle, absolutely. But he also says something there. But a man may show as reckless a courage in entering into the abyss of himself. Wow. I thought about that. Entering into the abyss of yourself and the courage that that takes. Look at the last quote. This is from Revelation again. Teresa, we are going to unpack what Teresa read. I doubt we're going to get to it this week. That's the the changing thing. But the Revelation, at the end, The victor will inherit these things. But look what he calls the people who are not victorious. Have you ever thought of the ungodly as cowards? God does. He says the victor is going to inherit these things, but the cowards, their share is the second death. Interesting. Let's unpack this. I don't know if you have much connection with politicians or if you've ever dealt with a politician. They're not my favorite people. Uh, Years ago, 10, 15 years ago, I had a dealing. I was coaching basketball, again, basketball story. And uh, there was uh, a particular family that uh, were, were on the team that I was coaching. And this, this family just couldn't do enough for us, all over us. This just wanted to be friends, wanted to be the, their boys' best friends with Tom and Tad. Well, the time came and developed when I was no longer their coach because they moved up in the system. Let me tell you something. They dropped us like a hot potato. We weren't important anymore. And Teresa wondered about it. She said, what, what do you make of that? What's going on? And, and I said, they're a politician. And I know that to be true because they came from a political family. And I said, they learned this ledger system. You know, that's what politics, politics is a ledger system. If you want to be in the club, in other words, in politics, what, what, what do you, if you want to get something done in this nation, sadly, what do you have to do? If you want to influence your politician, what do you have to do? Believe me, there's a ledger system. You cough up the contribution or you ain't going to be heard. That's the ledger system of politicians. You see, if you want to be in the club, if you want to be in there, you got to play the game. And the game is the ledger system. They keep track of what you do for them before they're going to do anything for you. And very much in politicians, it shows who is in and who is out. Now, I really don't, I hate that system. That is so antithetical to scripture. Keeping, Teresa says people do that in marriages. She says they keep a ledger system. That you've done this, now I'm going to do that. You didn't do this, so I'm not going to do that kind of thing. That's politician. But but you know what happened to me? I read scripture and I read some verses in scripture where Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, have you ever struggled with this? The first thing he gives the Beatitudes and he says, the fifth Beatitude, he says, you're blessed if you're merciful because you're going to receive mercy. Then he says, when, they, when he gives his prayer, he, I, know, I know you've struggled with these verses. Then he says when, in the prayer, He gives the uh, petitions of the Lord's Prayer. He says, forgive us 
in the same way that we forgive others. And then, and then he finally says, judge us with the same measurement and with the same kind of tenacity that we judge others. So what does that sound like to you? Does that sound like a ledger system? It does to me, doesn't it? In other words, what that is saying is, if I want to receive mercy, I should go out and start being merciful to people, and God's going to keep track of that, and if I'm merciful enough, then I'm going to receive mercy, right? And then, he, and then how about the forgiveness thing? If I want to be forgiven, I should go out and start forgiving people because God is, again, going to keep track of that ledger system, and he's going to forgive me the same way I forgive others. And, and if I'm critical of people and judgmental, that, that then God is going to turn around and be critical and judgmental of me. So, so the temptation there is to look at that as, as a political ledger system, that we have to be merciful, we have to be forgiving, and we have to be non-critical in order to receive the same treatment from God. Are you with me? Do you think that way? You've read those verses? Well, well here's the question. If it's not a ledger system, then, then what does, what's Jesus getting at? Why does Jesus put such emphasis, in other words, on people who are merciful? I'm going to think of myself, listen, I've told you what God does to me. And boy, did he do it to me when I was preparing this message. And I wish he would stop doing this, but he does. He puts me through this stuff. He has me experience it in shoe leather. And then, then I'm better equipped, although it's painful, better equipped to come and tell you about this. So how do you do with mercy and forgiving and criticizing? How do you do with that? Because Jesus puts high premium on those characteristics in people. And, and you know, here's the thing. Jesus is the one whose approbation I have to have. I need it. Because I'll tell you this, there is one immutable truth in Scripture. Immutable. We must please that one that Paul says God has appointed this man to give the final word on everybody. When he gives the Areopagus address, he says God has appointed a man to do this thing. So therefore, what do we do to please this man? If someone holds your fate in their hand, you need to know what, what do I have to do to get their notice, right? What do I have to do to get into their favor? Well, Jesus says right here, I'm going to look favorably on you if you're merciful, if you're forgiving, and if you're non-critical and non-judgmental, he puts a high premium on those characteristics and qualities in a person. Why? And on the other hand, why does he condemn so vociferously those people who aren't that way? He says to the goats, you're gone, you're cursed, get away from me because you weren't merciful, you weren't forgiving, and you were very critical. So why? What is it about those things that Jesus wants us to have, and, and in fact, it is our eternal destiny depends on us being merciful, forgiving, and non-critical. And why does he condemn it? I'll tell you why. You know why? It shows something. Now get a hold of this. A merciful, forgiving, non-critical person, I struggle with all of those. There's people in my life I need to forgive. And I haven't. There's people in my life that I've not shown mercy to and, and people that I criticize. And I hate that about myself. And yet, I understand that it shows something. The reason Jesus puts, puts a premium on this is because it shows the heart of the matter, I think. It shows who has genuinely repented because that is immutable. Genuine repentance is the gold standard requirement that God is going to hold us up against on that day. Have you genuinely repented? And a genuinely repentant heart is one who, the heart of the matter, when you see your neighbor what do you see? What do you see? If you've genuinely repented, you see yourself. You see your neighbor 
you see yourself. How else could we possibly, when the lawyer stands up and asks Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus gives, he gives an answer. He says, you've got to love your neighbor as yourself. How can I possibly love my neighbor as myself unless when I see my neighbor, I see myself? And it speaks to the heart of the matter. And it is this, how can I possibly? You want to know if you genuinely repented? And I ask myself this question. Holy Spirit does a lot of work in my life. When you you ask yourself the hard questions, when you have the courage to enter into the abyss of yourself, how can I possibly be unmerciful and be unforgiving and be critical? And how can you possibly be that way when something has happened to me and something has happened to you? And that is when I see myself as the same or worse than the person that I'm about to unload on. When I see myself the same or worse than, how can I not be merciful and forgiving and non-judgmental? You know, Teresa read that letter, and the thing about that, that letter that she read, that Jesus wrote to the church, and he, did you hear that? The church of Laodicea. Jesus is writing to the church, not the world. You know what he has against those people in that church? the attitude that they have about themselves. How do you see yourself in relation to your neighbor? Because maybe you've never done anything. Maybe you've not had any kind of hardship or pain or hurt. And maybe you think you're above the fray. That was the church at Laodicea. He says, this is what I've got against you. You don't see yourself when you see your neighbor. You say, I've got it all. I'm rich. I'm not pitiful. I'm not wretched. I'm not poor. I'm not blind. I'm not naked. Seeing yourself as the same or worse than the person you're about to be unmerciful to, unforgiving to, and critical of, is the definition of, and it is the requirement of repentance. Did you hear that? Repeat that back to me. I tell my patients that. They hate it. I give them home instructions. I say, now you take this medication this way, and you use ice this often, and you do this, you know, and then I'm all done. I'll say, now, tell me back what I just said to you. Uh, I'm supposed to use heat, and uh, I'm supposed to, uh, you know, they, they don't get it. They, they never know. So then, so then, then I, okay, I'm going to try it again. I tell him again, then I make him repeat it back. So repeat that back to me. Seeing yourself, good, Sarah. Happy birthday, Sarah. It's her birthday yesterday. Happy birthday. See, <laughs> seeing, listen, this is genuine repentance. The definition of, the definition of and the requirement in order for us to be genuinely repentant, you see yourself as worse than, or the same at least, as your neighbor. That's the problem in Laodicea. That takes courage. Listen, stay with me for another 20 minutes. That takes courage. And a courageous heart is a genuinely repentant heart that has been changed. Why why do we struggle in God's church with people who are not merciful? And why, why, why was I and am I slash not merciful to somebody else? Why are you not merciful? And why are you not forgiving? Because I have not genuinely repented. I do not see myself as the same or worse than. I see myself as better than. I told one of my patients this week, you've heard me say this. We do not, get this, we do not come to God by doing everything right. You've got to let go of that right now because you are a Laodicean if you think that. You come to God by doing everything wrong. 
and having the courage to understand it and look at yourself and enter, to enter into the abyss of yourself. There's one thing that Jesus made eminently clear in the Sermon on the Mount, remember? Eminently clear. You've heard it said that if you don't do thus and so, you're in. And Jesus says, you know what? I'm going to tell you, I'm giving you a new standard. If you do not see yourself as wretched and poor and pitiful and blind and naked, you're out. A courageous heart that has entered into the abyss of themselves. Now, I think, I think some of you struggle with this. Because I struggle with it. And a courageous heart that has entered into the abyss of themselves and is genuinely repented has, has a certain look about it. Has a certain feel about it. Well, I can tell that you've been, you've been to a particular seminar because there's something different about you now. You look differently. Why does Jesus put a premium on mercy? Do you criticize people? I do. You know what stops me cold? I'm like Macbeth. Remember Macbeth killed Duncan. It was his house guest. He killed Duncan because he thought he was a terrible king. And he's got an opportunity to kill him. He's, because Duncan thinks he's so much better. And he's going to be a better king. So he kills Duncan as a house guest. Macbeth does the terrible deed, and he's, he's leaving the room, and he catches a glimpse of himself in the mirror. Scripture is scripture's that mirror for us, for me. I can't criticize somebody when I think of Tim Davis in my attitudes, in my heart, in my life. Because a genuinely repentant heart is, has a certain look about it, and it looks merciful, it looks forgiving, and it looks non-critical and non-judgmental. And remember this, this little statement. It's not how to get in, okay? It's not a ledger system. Do not leave thinking I'm going to start tomorrow to be merciful and forgiving and non-critical. And if I do that, the political ledger system of God will kick in and he will therefore be merciful and forgiving and non-critical to me. It's not how to get in, but it sure shows who is in. Do you see that? Do you see the difference? Now, how does this occur in your life? How do you get to that point where you, like Macbeth, look in the mirror and see yourself for what you really are? There's the courage. That's painful, isn't it? To see yourself as you really are? That hurts. Let's look at Paul. How about Paul? And here's where you, maybe you want to open up your Bibles and go with me a little bit here on a couple of verses. I want to talk about Paul. And how he changed. And we're going to go to, where is, Paul's, where is Paul introduced in Scripture? Right, Acts. We turn to Acts chapter 8. Who wrote Acts? Luke, right. Go to Acts chapter 8. Now, you know why I'm going to use Paul as an example? Because Paul, look where Paul went from. Look at the metamorphosis in Paul's life. Paul went from saying he was perfect in the law. Remember? He said, as far as the law went, I was faultless. And he said, I, I, I proceeded in Judaism far beyond any of my contemporaries because I had such zeal for the, for the traditions of my ancestor. Paul saw himself as the man. He had it all, and he went against Christians because he thought they were not keeping the law. They weren't doing as Paul thought they should be doing. You ever do that with somebody? And at the end, that's how Paul starts out. And we're introduced to Paul. What does Paul say about himself at the end when he takes a retrospective view of his career? You remember? What's he say? What a change in a person. He says, among sinners, I am, I am chief. How did Paul get there? How did Paul get to be so merciful, so forgiving, 
and so non-judgmental that he goes from being perfect before the law to saying, among sinners I am chief. And when he saw his neighbor, he saw himself. Look at chapter 8, actually the end of chapter 7 of Acts. And we're introduced to Paul. What's happening here? What's happening to Stephen? Stephen's being stoned to death. Look at seven, chapter 7, verse 58. Stephen uh, talks about seeing, having an apocalyptic moment and seeing the Son of Man standing next to, to, uh, to God on his throne. And they become enraged and they take Stephen and they throw him out of the city. And they're going to stone him to death. And Luke masterfully writes in verse 58 of chapter 7, And the witnesses laid their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. That's the very first time we're introduced to Paul slash Saul. You know why they laid their robes at the feet of him? You know what Paul's job was? You know why they took their robes off when they're stoning people? So they didn't get splattered with their blood. And Paul, this is Paul, stands there and guards their robes so no one runs off with them while they're murdering Stephen. This is Paul. Stephen's starting to die, verse, verse 60 there at chapter 7. Stephen kneels down and cries out with a loud voice, get this, Lord, how would, you, how would you do with this? How would I do with this if someone's stoning me to death? Would the last words on my lips be, don't charge them with this sin? Merciful, forgiving, and non-judgmental out of Stephen as he's being stoned to death. Why? Because Stephen had undergone a genuine repentance and had a changed heart. And this is what a changed heart looks like. You know how far I am from this? In saying this, he fell asleep. End of the chapter. Gap. Chapter 8. Saul agreed with putting him to death. This is the writer of the greatest epistles in Scripture. What happened to him? That he became so merciful, forgiving, and non-judgmental that he goes from, that's a good thing you just did. He deserved it. Stephen wasn't keeping the Torah. He should have died. Saul agreed with putting him to death. On that same day, a severe persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all the apostles, everybody scattered. The Christians are running for their lives. But devout men, he said, they buried Stephen and mourned over him deeply. Look at verse 3. Saul, however, slash Paul, was ravaging the church, and he would enter house after house drag off men and women and put them in prison. This is a violent picture. Dragging them out of their homes. Taking them to prison so they can meet the same fate that Stephen just met. Destroying families. This is Paul. This is what he did. This is how he made his living. Got that picture? The antithesis of merciful, forgiving, and non-critical. Would you agree with that? Dragging men and women out of their homes to take them to prison, pretty much the opposite of merciful, forgiving, and, non and uh, non-critical. Chapter 9. I love the way Luke writes. You've got to love the way Luke writes. The way he inserts things and he has gaps and he brings stories back together. He leaves Saul for a while. The last thing we know about Saul slash Paul is he's dragging men and women out of their homes, children screaming, throwing them in prison, men and women being murdered at Paul's word, chapter 9. Meanwhile, back to Paul. Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He's still on this murderous rampage. Something's about to happen, though. The other shoe's about to drop in Paul's life. Did the other shoe drop in your life yet?
If your heart is critical, unmerciful, and unforgiving, you're, you're not maybe dragging people out of their homes. But you're, you're at the self-righteous pole. You're at, you're at the self-righteous side of this equation. He went, so Paul goes to the high priest. He says, you know, I've, I've used up everybody here in Jerusalem. I've pretty much taken care of all of the, the Christian families, destroyed them, had some people killed. I've done a good job here. Now, I want you to give me some letters of authority. And I know that there are some synagogues up in Damascus. And I know that there are some Christians up there in Damascus that are, that are following this, this heretic, this resurrection movement. They're, they're, they've glommed on to this man, Jesus of Nazareth. I want you to send me up there with letters that give me the authority to do the same thing up there. Do you see this? He's willing. How far, how far out of your way do you go to criticize somebody? You make it a mission? Or to be unmerciful or unforgiving? Paul's willing to go way out of his way and leave Jerusalem and travel north, clear up to Syria to go to Damascus for the very purpose of causing havoc and damaging and harming people. So they give him the letters of authority. He's on his way up to Damascus. Verse 3. As he's traveling and was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. You know the story. He falls to the ground. Jesus of Nazareth speaks directly to him. And do you know what struck me here? Jesus says to him, why are you persecuting me? You know what struck me? When I criticize somebody, when I'm unmerciful to somebody and unforgiving, you know who I am unmerciful and unforgiving and critical of? That woke me up. Whatever you do to the least of these, you did it to me, Jesus says. We're doing it to him. We're doing it to him. Why are you doing this, Paul? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus of Nazareth. I'm the one you're persecuting and destroying and damaging when you are being unmerciful to these people. You're doing it to me. Verse 9, he was unable to see, after this experience, he was unable to see for three days, and he did not eat or drink for three days. What's going on here? This is Paul's repentance. Do you see this? This is where Paul has the courage to look at himself and realize, wow, that must have been, I think of Paul, think, think, think of the angst and the regret that he had to have. You ever regret hurting somebody? He destroyed families. He gets it. He understands he is worse than the people he was going after. And he can never make it right. You, get, you understand that? He has hurt families and destroyed people, men and women, and he can never make it right. Do you know the courage it would take to face that? Instead of the obstication and the denial and the running from that that, 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 that I, would be tend, I would tend to do, I'd have to hide from that truth. I remember when we, when we were going through that, whatever it was we went through with Timmy. And I would, and we would, I would want to hide from the diagnosis. I would want to run from that truth. But I understood it. It, you had, it took courage to face that bad news, to face that in ourselves. If you have an unmerciful, unforgiving, and critical heart, 
you are a coward. That's what Jesus says. Because a courageous heart looks inward at their own foibles and understands, I am worse than the person I'm attacking. How can I possibly continue down that road? And Paul sits for three days contemplating. Believe me, he's wrestling with what he had done. And he doesn't even eat or drink because his regret and remorse and recrimination is so great. I contrasted that with Adam. Adam. Talk about courage. Here's Paul showing courage. Here's Adam showing cowardice. I often wonder when I read Genesis, do you ever wonder what would have happened if, if Adam would have repented right away? What if Adam had repented? But he doesn't, does he? Adam takes the opposite approach. When God walks through the garden and Adam hides, he says, and God says, what are you doing? And Adam says, well, I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. Versus Paul not being afraid, being courageous and facing it. Adam never repents in that story. What's the next thing Adam does after he hides? He blames his wife. <laughs> he never repents because he's a coward. Oh, I know it's hard to look at yourself. I know it. God's not done with, that, with Paul. Paul's on his way to becoming merciful, forgiving, and non-critical because he has courage. Verse 10. Now, imagine being Ananias. You know the story? Now in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and Ananias, yeah, here I am, Lord. Uh, Ananias, get up, go over to the street called Straight, and there's a man from Tarsus there. I love the way Jesus comes at him obliquely. <laughs> because Ananias knows who Saul is. His reputation preceded him. So, so, so the Lord kind of says, oh, there's somebody over there from Tarsus. Uh, oh, and his, it's Saul. Well, Ananias says, whoa, whoa, God, you ever argue with the Lord? You must not really understand, Lord, because this is the same man who was in Jerusalem and he has done great damage to the saints there. He has destroyed people, Ananias says. You can't possibly mean that I'm to go over there to him. What does God say to him? He says, it's okay. Because he's praying. You see that? Since he asked for a man from Tarsus named Saul, and it's okay, you're safe. Because he's praying. He's had a change of heart. <laughs> And Ananias, he says, go over there, place your hands on him, and uh, re 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 give his sight back to him. Um, verse 15, go, never mind your, your protestations, Ananias, and I know this is treacherous, and I know you might not even, can you imagine the trust it took here for Ananias? Imagine that. I want you to go. For this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before Gentiles, before kings, before the brethren. And I'm going to show him how much he's going to have to suffer for this job. Do you know why? Do you know when Paul became the chosen instrument here in this story? It was Paul's reaction to the bright light that was his choosing. I want you to understand this. You've got a choice too, and I've got a choice. There's a bright light that shines into our lives. Remember David? Nathan comes to him and says, you're the man. 
A bright light comes into our lives when we have the courage to enter into the abyss of ourselves. When we have the courage to look at ourselves and know that we are worse and no better than anybody else. It was because Paul had the courage to spend those three days in deep regret and repentance and looking inside of himself and his own heart that Jesus says, you're the man. I often wondered if Paul had done the Adam thing. The bright light, Adam had the bright light. He knew he was naked. He, he had to fear, and he reacted cowardly, and he hid. I often wonder if Paul takes that tact here, we're never hearing about Paul again. He's not the chosen instrument. But Paul reacts in a courageous way and allows that bright light on that road to Damascus to show the abyss of himself. Now, I want you to understand something. God does not want, don't, don't, don't get this wrong, God doesn't want you to sit around in, in incriminating or recriminating yourself. Okay? He doesn't want, yes, he shines a bright light into our lives, not for the purpose so that we spend the rest of our days in those three-day period of the Paul sulking and being depressed and being ineffective and being blind and doing nothing. I want you to watch what happens to Paul. Verse 17, Ananias enters the house, places his hands on Paul, and he says, it was Jesus who appeared to you. It was Jesus who sent me over here. You, Paul, your life is about to take a 180-degree turn. You are now the instrument and he places his hands on Paul and verse 18. At once, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Now, what's, what are we to do with this? What, what am I to do when I enter into the abyss of myself and I have the courage to see myself as God sees me? Jesus says in that letter to Laodicea, the first, in the very first verse, very first sentence, he says, here's what, here's, what, here's what stopped me short. Jesus says, I know your works. You ever think about that? Jesus knows your works. Paul does something. He gets his sight back. He does four things. Then he got up. He's baptized. He eats and regains his strength. Verse 20, immediately he begins proclaiming. See, we're not to stay in a, in a state of guilt-ridden regret and remorse. That does nobody any good. I know people like that. You do too. They never get out of that three-day period of not eating and drinking. They, they enter into the abyss of themselves. They never come out. They stay on a perpetual pity party for themselves and perpetual regret over what they've done. Let me tell you something, that is a slap in the face of the redemptive power of the Holy Spirit. How, how do you look at Christians that have stumbled? What do we do in our churches to people that have stumbled? Oh, you can't serve. You can't be on council. You can't be a deacon. You can, heaven forbid, be a pastor because you've done thus and so. What an insult to the redemptive power of the Holy Spirit in a man's life. Don't laud those who have never done anything wrong because that is idolatry to self-righteousness. Be careful. That's humanism to the nth degree. Who's the hero in this story? It's not Paul. It's not Ananias. It's the redemptive power of Jesus of Nazareth, the one, our Lord and Master. That's the hero. You know what? Paul wouldn't be allowed to serve in our churches today. You don't meet the litmus test of the type of behavior we're looking for, Paul. 
He runs into that too. Paul runs into that same thing. No, listen. When you've entered into the abyss of yourself and the bright light of the Damascus Road shines into your life and you understand who you are and how God looks at you, you get up, you're baptized, you regain your strength, and you immediately go into service. Let God redeem that in your life. Let him use it. Verse 25. But his dis- the Jews try to kill him. But his disciples, his disciples, Paul gains disciples. Going from, and what kind of trust would that take for someone to be a disciple of Paul? Going from murdering and destroying and dragging men and women out of homes to now having this same ilk follow him and be his disciples. A courageous heart is a forgiving, merciful, non-critical heart. And we have got to be very careful as men and women of God that we do not let this infection into our lives and into our families and into our church. Because let me tell you, when you criticize somebody, this, this is the last thing I'm going to say. When you are unmerciful, when you are unforgiving, and when you are critical, the only person you're defining is yourself. That's the only person you're describing and defining to God. You are shouting to God, I am unrepentant. Verse 